Hi, I'm Brian with Mead Instruments, and this evening we're going to show you how to capture images with the LPIG, the LPIG Advanced, and the DSi-4 cameras using Mead's Sky Capture software. Sky Capture is a complete camera control program, and we're going to show you the major features this evening, including the live stack, which I find to be very useful. Please note that Sky Capture will only control the cameras mentioned, the LPIG, the LPIG Advanced, and DSi-4. It will not control older DSi camera models or cameras from different manufacturers. Uh, because of this, you don't need a special license. So if you do have one of those cameras, it's a free download. You can get it from mead.com. I have included a link in the video description. The cameras themselves also include CD, although understandably not all laptops include CD-ROMs anymore, but you now have multiple ways of receiving Sky Capture software. Okay, once installed, we're going to go ahead and open Sky Capture. I'll show you the major menu items that we might use just to get acquainted with the software. Under File, you'll find many of the same things that you might find with most Windows programs. When opening an image or a video that you previously captured with one of the cameras, uh, it does support most of the major image formats, including this one here, which is FITS, and that's the raw image format that you can capture with the LPIG, LPIG Advanced, or DSi-4. You may later export those raw images in any number of file formats, so it does support a wide range of image types that you might save as later. And under the Save and Save As, as straightforward as that might be, it's actually useful to know that you can use that to take a quick snapshot of something without necessarily having to record a full sequence or uh, a video. And so, for example, you want to take a quick image of the moon, you could simply save the image that is currently on your screen to do that. Quick and easy way to do that. And Edit, we won't really use. It's what you would find in many of the same different Windows programs will have that. Same with view. This is basically redundant with things that you would find in the sidebar. For example, histogram, which we'll show you in a little bit. Just basically going over here to image. You can find some of this in the sidebar as well, but some of these shortcuts can be useful. Uh, this is also something to note for process. There are some image processing tools in Sky Capture, but it's really primarily a camera capture program. You can definitely explore some of the features here including image stacking, and it is something that is very useful for deep sky imaging. But for the most part, we would recommend that you would export the images that you take here into the image editing software of your choice. And there's a lot of freeware that you can work with too, such as uh, Deep Sky Stacker and a number of other options. Now under Options and Preferences, this will include the save path to your video images and many display settings to customize the appearance of Sky Capture. So you can customize the look a little bit here, but mainly the things to look out for would be your save path that you want to have by default for recording and for batch recording. Um, I will show you also under, we'll be jumping around, but under trigger mode, you will also be able to set your save path for your deep sky images. Also, while you're exploring Sky Capture, take a note of the help contents, which is actually the complete Sky Capture manual, and it covers just about every feature, including ones that we simply wouldn't be able to go over in this video tutorial. So uh, make a note of that, and it's not online, which is nice. You can actually pull this manual up at any time while you're using Sky Capture. Now, at this point, our camera is still unplugged. I'm just looking at Sky Capture offline. And you can see our sidebar here, and there's a lot going on in the sidebar. So let's go over a few of these things before the camera is actually plugged in. And something to note is that many of the features will be grayed out because it's not connected to the camera. But it's useful to know what some of these things are so that you already have some familiarity with it to begin with. Under the camera list, this is where you'll find the camera model that you plug in, and that should appear automatically. Under Capture and Resolution, there are default settings when you plug your camera in. You can begin using the default settings, uh, but you can also change those, usually if, it's you if you want to choose to lower the resolution or change the format. The format here is especially applicable to color cameras. You're able to capture in RGB or in RAW. 
It's important to know that if you do capture in RAW, the image will not be debayered. So you'll have what appears to be a black and white image, and you would then later have to convert that image to color, which Sky Capture can do, as well as most image processing programs. But when you do capture RAW, you have to account for the color conversion of the camera. And if you export that image to another program, you have to account for that color conversion, which is RGGB, uh, Bayer Matrix, for the color cameras for LPIG, LPIG Advance, and DSi-4. Now, Snap is just that, takes an individual frame. And this is where I mentioned the file menu. You can snap an image and then simply save that image. Individual image, no problem. Record, you can record your video and it'll record uh, .ser format. You can change that later if you want it to be an AVI or, or a mainstream format that you can play later in a media player. But .ser is good for later stacking in a program like Registax or AutoStack or something like that if you're going to be using um, a video for planetary imaging. Now the gain and the exposure are two things that you might actually work with a lot and these of course are grayed out because we're still offline but the gain here and the exposure time here. The CMOS cameras have very low noise so you can actually run these things at fairly high gain to get a lot of image data or to be able to see something very quickly if you're just trying to get a preview of something. Uh, but the higher the gain, the more sensitive at the expense of noise. Exposure time is really going to depend on what you're imaging. And I do find that actually the auto exposure feature works pretty well if you're imaging something, especially a, a planetary or object or the moon or something when it's really bright. A deep sky object, not so much. You're probably going to have to manually enter the exposure time, which we'll show you in a little bit. Now to continue showing you the features on the sidebar, it's really better that we connect the camera so that all these grayed out features become enabled and then we can better show you what they are and how to control them. So let's go ahead and connect your camera. It's very straightforward. You would just connect your camera to the USB port on your PC. If you are using the DSi-4 and you have external power, also plug the 12 volt external power into the camera and that will turn on the thermoelectric cooler. So I'm going to go ahead and plug the camera in right now, and then you should see the camera appear here under the camera list. If your camera has been properly installed, it'll show up here. Now on my computer right now, I'm actually uh, using a USB 2 port, even though in this case the DSi-4 does support a USB 3 super speed, but it is backwards compatible since my computer currently doesn't support that, so that's something to keep in mind. It would only really affect your frame rate if you were trying to capture images for planetary imaging and won't really have an impact for deep sky imaging for, for still frame imaging, which is what my main focus would be if I'm using the DSi-4 mono. Now, if your camera does not appear in the camera list when you plug it into the USB port, either the hardware is not recognized or the camera drivers simply have not been installed yet. So just confirm that you have installed your camera drivers with the CD that came with the camera, or of course you can download them from me.com, and I've included links for that in this video. The simple way to start now that we see our camera in the camera list, simply click on the camera right here, and now your video, your live view, will display here. I have the camera on my desk right now with the cap, so we're seeing a black frame, no light is entering the camera, but now all these features that we saw that were grayed out have been enabled so you can better see these, feature these features. Now I pointed out resolution earlier. This is the full resolution of the camera. It's uh, 4640 by 3506. As mentioned though, you may choose to decrease that. And, and please note that when you do that, you're actually cropping the frame to that resolution. Uh, so that's important to know that you're gonna be uh, cropping the field of view when choosing the lower resolution. Unless you have you know, limited space or, or reason to want to use the lower resolution, I would typically always use the full resolution. Now, this is a monochrome camera, and it's showing the format here, RGB24. That's really not necessary um, because there is no Bayer matrix. So with the monochrome camera, you can always simply shoot RAW. 
If you're using a color camera, as I mentioned, this is very important because RGB24 will give you an instant color image that you don't have to convert later. RAW will give you what appears to be a black and white image that'll show the Bayer pattern that would have to be converted to color later, which is something you can do in Sky Capture. But if you do export your images later as a RAW, uh, you will have to account for the color conversion. And it not knowing what the camera is, if you're using a third party program, that's something to keep in mind. With the DSi-4 and the LPI series, LPI G series camera, the color conversion is RGGB. That's red, green, green, blue. That's how the Bayer matrix is arranged. Programs may ask you that. If you don't want to guess or you don't want to concern yourself with that, choose RGB24 for one-shot color cameras. Again, I'm using the monochrome camera. I'm going to keep this at RAW, but that's something to pay attention to if you're using a color camera. Now the gain that I had mentioned and the exposure time, these have now been enabled. And we can turn this up. Now even with a black frame, if I turn the gain way up, I may actually start to introduce noise here. And the reason why we don't see anything yet is, for one, we're still looking at a black frame. For another, this is a good time to jump over to the histogram. I'm scrolling down, we're going to go to histogram. Now this being a black frame, most of the information is here in the shadows on the left side of the histogram. If I want to start to see what's going on even with the noise in the image, I can click auto and look at that. This is the exact same image that we saw a moment ago. We haven't done anything to actually change the image, we're just changing the range that my display is looking at. And so now we can see a bunch of noise. There's still no light entering the camera. But you can see how noisy it gets if I just turn the gain way up. Um, we can tune the gain down. And then if you want to readjust, just hit auto again. You can also manually adjust the histogram, these, sidebar, these sliders right here. There's one on the right that clips the highlight side. And there's one on the left that clips the shadow side. So I could manually bring this to a setting of my choosing, like this, for example. And this can be fine-tuned later. Again, this does not affect the actual image. This merely affects the display of the image. But it can be useful. And you will probably find the same thing that I did just now. When you first plug in the camera and you connect, you just get a black frame. And of course, I'm not looking at anything right now. There's no light entering the camera. But even so, you should ideally see at least some noise. Because if you do start to, when you connect this to a telescope, if you do start to see an out-of-focus star, you'll want to be able to see the background. Otherwise, you still might just see a black image. Because an out-of-focus star might be like a very large out-of-focus point that you would not otherwise be able to see if you did not at least make an adjustment to the histogram or choose auto on the histogram. One other thing to note, if you are getting just a black image as seen here, and your camera is supposed to be getting light if you're actually looking through the telescope and light is entering the camera, but you just get a black image no matter what, you may want to check and make sure that your frame rate is fully supported. And it might just be that you have to decrease the frame rate and or decrease the resolution or the bit depth. In some cases, if it overwhelms the system, uh, right now, I'm only running at half a frame per second with what I'm running at uh, two seconds here. So we can speed that up. But this USB 2 connection that I have right now isn't going to run very fast. But if you have a problem with that, you can decrease the frame rate by increasing the exposure time. You can lower the resolution if necessary. You can also lower the bit depth if necessary. Preferably, you wouldn't do any of those things. But it's something to keep in mind if you are not able to get an image at first. We had our video mode and our trigger mode. When you connect to your camera, the default is video mode. And it's nice because you get a live preview. And you can manipulate the, the frame rate um, by adjusting the exposure time. Now, right now, we're using a DSi-4 downloading the full frame and I'm connected via USB 2 and not USB 3, 
I'm really only getting just about one frame per second, uh, even though my exposure time is only 10 milliseconds. It's important, uh, especially for planetary imaging, if you want to lower the frame rate, um, you can increase the exposure time uh, and you can compensate by decreasing the gain. There's a lot you can do to basically control the image to get the right amount of brightness and the frame rate. For deep sky imaging, the fact that I'm only getting a frame per second is not a big deal. I'm mainly going to be using this video mode to get a live preview as I focus on a target. You can increase the exposure time using the slider. You can also specify the exposure time here. Now, in the exposure time slider, you're limited to 5,000 milliseconds or 5 seconds. Let's say for now I'm going to take 2,000 milliseconds, which would be 2 seconds. Obviously, for deep sky, you may want to take a much longer exposure than that. And this is where trigger mode comes in. So I'm going to go ahead and toggle over to trigger mode. Now my live view has stopped right now. Here I can specify minutes, seconds, milliseconds, microseconds if necessary. Typically we're just going to be talking about minutes and seconds. So here I can do 5 seconds, I can do 30 seconds, I could do 10 minutes. Uh, where deep sky imaging is involved, there's really no hard limit on what your exposure time can be. Um, we often have many imagers uh, very happy between, say, three to five minute exposures. If we did three minutes, 30 seconds, or whatever time you want to set here. Then you could take a single image. So actually, let me, let me do that now. Well, let's take a 10 second image. Uh, let's take a 20 second image and get some noise in there and we'll take a single shot. Now you'll see the, the progress here. You can do this on an LPIG advanced. Typically you're not going to take a long exposure on the LPIG ex uh, series because you're shooting something like the moon or Jupiter, something quick like that. But you can still extend the exposure time and do some bright deep sky work with the LPIG advanced. And here is our 20 second image. And there's one thing you'll notice that you didn't see at the live preview with all these dots. Well, these dots are hot pixels, and these are the things that are removed when taking a dark frame. So these hot pixels, it's standard. This is thermal noise that you see as you extend the exposure time. And this is at minus 5 degrees Celsius, 5 degrees below freezing. And the warmer the camera is, the more pronounced and numerous these hot pixels become. This is almost something you'll never have to face when taking a short exposure. All cameras have this type of noise. Uh, you never see them typically for a daytime camera because you're taking maybe a, a one thousandth of a second exposure and you're getting tons of light entering the camera. Um, but for deep sky imaging, you're contending with a very low amount of signal. And so you start to see that camera noise in the background. So we can extend our exposure time as I've done here. Trigger mode is also where we're able to take a sequence of images. I can specify the number of images I want to take. You know, this is if you want to make it automatic. If I'm taking, let's say I'm taking three minute exposure and I want to take 10 of those, we can specify 10 or let's say even 20 of them. Because we're not taking an especially long exposure here. Now we click on Options. This is where you're going to want to set the save path and the file prefix. Uh, I'm not looking at anything just yet, but if we're tonight going to look at a crescent moon, we can name it the moon, and we're probably then not going to take a long exposure if it was the moon. Maybe it's, maybe it's M42, the Orion Nebula. Maybe you just name your target here. File type, as I mentioned in the very beginning, FITS file type is good. That's your raw file format. That's the main way that it's going to capture. You can export to whatever file type you would like later, but it's important that it just it initially captures in this raw format. And you can start your sequence number if you, if you want. Um, this is my first sequence here, so we don't really need to do that. And, you know, the save path wherever you'd like it to be. And it will automatically save a date code when doing that. And so I'll just keep that there. 
So if we were to shoot Orion later, all I have to do now to begin the sequence is to click Sequence, and it'll begin. Okay, back to a couple of the things I showed you at first that were grayed out. We talked about resolution and format. We want to cover bit depth, which was grayed out before. This will change depending on the camera that you have plugged in. You notice it defaulted to 8 bits. Again, I would recommend that you choose the higher bit depth whenever possible. An exception to that is if you're going to stream images or stream video for planetary capture. 8 bits is then okay because you may be taking uh, say a 30 second or 60 second video that could consume easily a couple gigabytes of data on your hard disk even at 8 bits. If you choose the higher bit depth it takes that much more space on your hard disk and is usually not that necessary because you'll be stacking several hundred even maybe a couple thousand frames for planetary imaging. For the DSi4 camera it's a 12 bit depth that's your higher uh, option. On the LPIG Advanced it's 14 bits and on the LPIG it's 12 bits. And just choose the higher bit depth of, as I've done here for deep sky imaging. Now since I'm connected to the DSi4 I'll show you some additional features that are specific to that camera and for deep sky imaging. I'm going to go ahead and minimize the histogram and bit depth here because there's just a lot of a lot of options on the sidebar here. I'm going to go to cooling and this only applies to the DSi-4. If you look on the lower right hand side of the screen you'll see the temperature readout. In this case it's zero degrees Celsius. Well how did it get to zero degrees which is freezing? Well when I turn the camera on and connected to it, it automatically powered on the thermoelectric cooler. And there's a target temperature here which is at zero degrees. Now the DSi-4 can comfortably go to at least 30 degrees below the ambient temperature in Celsius. And right now it's about 20 degrees in the room. So I could go to minus 10. And just to show you the temperature change, we'll just go to minus 5. Click Apply. Now you're going to see the thermoelectric cooler is going to have to power up a little bit to cool the chip down a little more. And now we'll start to see this temperature drop. It's important that you let the temperature stabilize before you begin imaging. That way, later, if you're taking calibration images, uh, the, the noise levels will be consistent from frame to frame, and you'll be able to accurately subtract dark frames. And also, the colder the temperature, the lower the noise, and you can reach points of no return. With CMOS cameras like these, the, the noise is fairly low to begin with, and Every time you drop the camera temperature by five or six degrees, you're cutting the noise in half. So we were already at freezing, and I'm going to bring this to five below. So five below is going to be almost just about half of the noise that it was at zero. And at some point, it just gets to be nominal. So I mention this because it's really not necessary to try to push that cooler as hard as possible. It's actually good to have some buffer. Right now, it's only at you know, 37% power and climbing as it gets to minus five. You really don't want to see the cooler power sitting at 95% or something because what will happen is throughout the course of the night, if the temperature increases, which it can do at night, suddenly you've lost your ability to now sustain this temperature. And it's more important to sustain the selected temperature than it is to have it be as cold as possible. So if I'm consistently minus five throughout the whole night, that's far, more, that's far more important than having it set to minus 10 and occasionally having it move up and down from 10 to 7 and having inconsistent temperature throughout your imaging session. Now that looks like the cooling has just about stabilized almost perfectly at minus 5C. It may bump up and down a tenth of a degree, but typically will we'll stay level at minus 5. I'll go ahead and minimize the, the cooling menu here. Now let's go to dark field correction. This is applicable to all the cameras. It's especially applicable to deep sky imaging because of a couple of things. Typically the image exposure is much longer and will therefore have more noise in it, especially thermal noise. And deep sky imaging is just naturally a little bit noisier because planetary imaging can afford to be 
a little bit more noisy because you're integrating so many frames. I mean, several hundred, even uh, a couple thousand frames is, is common for planetary imaging. For deep sky imaging, we may only be stacking 10 or 15 frames. So we want to suppress the noise as much as possible. And again, longer exposures uh, tend to show much more of that noise. But it is applicable to both cameras. So a dark field, also called dark frame, it basically isolates the noise with the camera capped, as I have it right now. There's no light entering the camera, so we're just seeing the noise. Some of this noise is fixed, like a hot pixel or something, and that noise can actually be subtracted in your light frame later. What's nice about sky capture is you can capture your dark frames and apply them to your light frames while shooting in color. If you are using a color imager, you can shoot an RGB 24, RGB 48, full bit depth and still take your dark field correction. Typically if you export your images and you shoot raw you have to shoot everything raw and shoot your dark frame separately to properly subtract the dark frame whereas in sky capture you can do it on the fly so to speak in color if you want and still be able to subtract your dark frames and that's nice to be able to do. It also saves you a step in processing so for example Let's say I want to take five dark frames. Okay, I'll capture those five. You can see the status here. Again, it's important that you've kept your telescope capped. In this case, the camera is capped. Now, if I click Enable, it's going to apply those dark frames to everything that I photograph for this imaging session. So if I click Enable, now our frames become perfectly black because all that image noise that you saw before was subtracted. That's not to say it's solid black, that's just what it looks like right now. Now there's also flat field correction. That's another form of image calibration. Flat field correction is optional, but typically only useful with a larger sensor, like that on the DSi-4. It may not be needed for the LPIG or the LPIG Advanced because they're smaller sensors. Typically, if the telescope does not illuminate fully to the corners of the frame, you get what's called vignetting and the flat field can correct for that. It also corrects for any other various forms of uneven field illumination even as it might pertain to telescope collimation or what can be useful you do sometimes get dust on the optical window no matter how much you try cleaning your camera it's inevitable that you may get some dust obstruction which can appear as a semi-translucent gray blob or gray circle on your light frames and flat fields are good at basically removing those artifacts from your image. It's more pronounced in the DSi-4 because the sensor is much larger. Um, and so this is something you can do. Uh, you can take, there's a number of ways you can do it. Um, the easiest way is actually just taking a sky flat where you point your telescope at a, a uniform portion of the sky during dusk or at dawn, or if you've covered the telescope with something like a white t-shirt or a flat sheet of paper or something so that the light is completely uniform and diffuse and then you take your flat field it's a featureless uniform light that you want to get into the camera sensor and there can be an art form in doing that um, honestly even flat fields can be its own topic um, people use light panels all, all kinds of things to to take good flats but it's something to be aware of and it's something that you can calibrate easily in sky capture just as we've done with the dark you can capture your flat the telescope's not capped it's actually allowing light in as i've described and then you can enable those flat field corrections on the fly and again it's super useful it completely removes a step in your processing later because now you can have images that automatically have the dark field and flat field correction taken into account. Now if you're going to be exporting your images to another program later for image processing, there's a couple things to note. Um, we're going to have to identify what these images are later, whether you're taking a light frame or a dark frame, and that's recorded in the FITS header. So the FITS file format I talked about early on will apply here because it actually records all the metadata of your image. It'll do so automatically, but you can specify some of this if you're going to export it later. First, just take a look at the drop-down menu at the top here where it says Lightframe. 
you can specify the type of frame that you're taking here. So for example, if I was in trigger mode and taking a sequence of images, I would set my images here, take the photo, let's say it's Orion M42, but there's nowhere here that will tell you if you're taking a dark frame or a light frame. So it's good to record this in your metadata. In addition to that, it's also good to account for that in your naming convention. Uh, it's optional, but very recommended. So for example, M42, maybe that's the image I'm taking, but maybe I'm going to also take a series of darks with it. So I would record the file name as such, even though it's recorded in the FITS header, it's good to have it in your file name as well. One place you can go to if you really want to get into the details of the FITS header is go to Options, Preferences, then go to Metadata, and here you can intervene and actually add values of your own. There's a lot of information here, and this is what you'll find typically in a, in a full CCD image uh, FITS header, and many of the things you'll see is set to auto. You might actually uh, take a look at filter. Because for one, if you are using a, a filter wheel of some sort and you're using a series of filters, there is no value there unless you specify it. And that's something to keep in mind. So if you're going to shoot red, green, blue, you can specify the filter that you, shoot, that you are shooting through here and just to keep that into account. And it's really not necessary if you're shooting within Sky Capture and just exporting your final image there. Some of the onboard uh, processing um, that I'm showing you, which would include the, the dark frame and flat field calibration within Sky Capture, does not require that. But it is something to keep in mind if you're going to export these images later.